Welcome to the Texas Prison Board meeting, August 18, 2016, Austin, Texas. We're here to see the boards meet, see what kind of business they do under the Texas Open Meetings Act, and see if they allow for public comment. Let's go check it out. In the state, in honor of her memory, Sergeant Gil Arizmendi from the Dominguez Unit will play taps, followed by a moment of silence. Sergeant. The next speaker is Gloria Rubach, and your topic is listed as Diabetes Care. Would you please approach the podium, ma'am? Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Um, I want to, what did you say my topic was? It's listed as diabetes care. Oh, okay. Um, I, I, I didn't hear you well. Okay. Um, yeah, I wanted to talk to you about some of the things going on. I have friends and family in the Texas Department of Corrections. My adopted son, Michael Gonzalez, uh, has diabetes. It is not being treated. If he was in the free world and his blood sugar was between 300 and 400 every day, Somebody would be calling 911 and rushing him to the hospital. Michael has a very good lawyer and a good case of innocence, plus some other issues that are being raised, and I hope he will be home one day with his kidneys working, his vision intact, and nothing amputated. But the treatment he's getting is not adequate. In fact, it's lousy. The doctor at UTMB in Galveston prescribed a new medication for him, Finally, uh, after a million phone calls, they gave it to him once, and then the pharmacist at Polanski vetoed it and said he couldn't have it anymore. I want this looked into, because I don't want to see my friend and adopted son dead because of mistreatment of TDCJ. Another thing that just happened to my son-in-law, his mom called from California, he's at the Ramsey Unit, and uh, made arrangements to visit him on the weekend of his birthday in August and had a special visit. When she got there, they told her she couldn't see him because they were in lockdown. Now, I don't know when this started, but I visit people on lockdown. In fact, they're always glad to see me because I can buy them food because they get all those Johnny sacks. She had to fly back to California, lost her money on her hotel room, and had to fly back two weeks later buy another ticket to see her son for her birthday. This is unacceptable. And I just want to end by uh, saying that the permanent isolation on death row is cruel and unusual. Actually, it's usual punishment. And I'm going to read what Charles Flores wrote in his book. He is on death row. He had an execution date in June and got a stay. He says, a profound sense of despair wells up inside of me. After witnessing my friend try to kill himself, cutting up his arms and lying in a pool of blood, unconscious, I thought, what kind of environment am I in that drives a young, healthy man to take his life? Am I next? Why are people considering suicide? Why is it a constant subject of conversation? When will I lose control and want the peace that death seemingly brings? I knew this man. I liked him. And now to think that being on Texas death row has caused him to kill himself is a very hard thing to accept. After things in the pod quieted down, I got away from my cell door and sat on my bunk. I spent the rest of my night thinking of Tony and the elements of Texas death row that would drive him to commit suicide. I'm wondering what would drive me over the edge. All over the country, people are getting away with ad seg, special housing units, solitary, whatever you want to call it. It's wrong, it's expensive, and it's unnecessary. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rubach. Um, before you leave the podium, your adopted son's last name, you said his first name was Michael? Michael Gonzalez, 999-174. At the Polunsky unit? Yes, sir. Okay. And here. my son-in-law is Nanan Williams. He had been on death row, but he was a juvenile. So he's committed to life. He's at Ramsey. 
and his number is um, 1306434. Uh, Ms. Rubach, am I pronouncing that correctly? Rubach, yeah. Rubach. Um, I want to uh, uh, confirm for you that the department endeavors to do its best to provide the necessary health care for the offenders. We will look into this matter and you will receive a written response. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm diabetic. I know that if my blood sugar is over 100, I get upset. His is constantly three to 400. Okay. And with regard to procedures for visitation, they're generally well laid out, well defined, and, and uh, occur very conveniently for the offender and their families. We'll look into that and you'll get a written response as well. Is it, uh, aren't visits allowed during lockdowns? Okay. We'll provide a written response for you. We've, Thank you. We've got time limits and additional business to take All care right. of, but we'll get back to you. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your comments. The next speaker is Joanne Gavin. And Ms. Gavin, as you approach the podium, uh, you've listed your topic as prisoners medical and mental health. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thank you for having us. The medical and mental health of prisoners in Texas prisons and could be remedied by this board along with many other issues that people have not been permitted to bring before the board because it has forgotten that it is unlawful under the First Amendment of the United States Constitution to abridge the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. The board has more than abridged that right, it has all but eliminated it. Public comment has been restricted to but two meetings per year and then arbitrarily abridged at those meetings by cutting time allotted after people have prepared timed addresses and then ruling that comments on the same subject must be combined and delivered by one person. The people of Texas are not serfs who can be dismissed with a contemptuous wave of the hand of a feudal lord. We intend to inform the people and their honest representatives of this abuse. When the people are informed, they will be aroused and will demand that democratic rights be restored to those who bring their concern before this board. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And the final speaker, Elizabeth Marie, is it Brignac? Brignac. Brignac, okay. And your, uh, the topic you listed is rehabilitation and families. Thank you for joining us. You may proceed. Good morning. I am a resident of Houston here because I have one family member and several friends currently in TCJ. And I'm also here today as a survivor of violence to tell you that the current conditions in TCJ are unacceptable and detrimental to our communities as a whole, in addition to our families. There are thousands of us affected by TDCJ in this state, and we have not been given enough power to have a say in it and how it is affecting us. That must change. The family and friends of prisoners are people of this state. We are not separate entities. Prisoners are also part of our families and communities, and most of them will and should return to those communities. A recent study by the Alliance for Safety and Justice found that crime victims agree with shorter sentences and more focus on rehabilitation. The majority of Americans want the same. If we want to reduce the causes of crime in our state, we need to focus on education, rehabilitation, and building or maintaining ties to families and communities. Texas currently keeps thousands of prisoners in ADSEG, essentially denying them any of these things. As the ACLU suggested in the report from 2015, Texas must drastically reduce solitary because it exasperates violence and causes more harm and no perceivable good to the prisoner. It also harms the family of the prisoner greatly and erodes support networks, which are vital to rehabilitation. The damage caused by solitary confinement is not only harming our loved ones, but is harming our families and our communities. Other states have found a decrease or no change in violence from decreasing solitary use. Texas must implement better prop policies. Furthermore, many families cannot afford to visit their fathers, mothers, children, and spouses. 
due to distance and other concerns. The phone rates are outrageous and limit contact, and there are very few days, if any, where prisoners are allowed to interact with their children in a normal and healthy way. These policies are harming children and families. Texas can implement positive changes to build stronger families instead of tearing them apart. If we want to prevent future addiction, poverty, and violence, there should be more educational classes inside all Texas prisons, more rehabilitation programs, more counseling, more focus on health care, and more discussion about the causes of violence and ending the cycle. If it can be done outside of the prison system, then it can be done inside the system so that people do not return at such a high rate. The system is not supposed to be an industry. Our state needs healthy people returning to us, not people who were sick and made sicker by our system. We want an end to the exploitation of prisoners and their families. And for the million of us who have been disregarded, I don't know better. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Grignac. Thank you to all who presented today. Your comments have been noted and recorded. The issues raised today will be addressed by agency staff in written form. If you'd like to receive a copy of the written response, please provide your name and contact information on the follow-up sheet located on the speaker registration table. There being no further business, the 187th meeting of the Texas Board of Criminal Justice is now adjourned. It is 11.29 a.m. Namaste, y'all. Be safe. Film the police.